We're talking about pills and talking about that OTC Tom Heineber. We're talking about pills in an R&B jam. What up, Logan? What up, fam? It's your boy Z-Dog MD. Uh, I have been on the road doing gigs and gigs and more gigs. There were osteopaths, there were insurance people, there was Phoenix, there was Colorado, and then I come home and I check my box. And what do I see but an article purporting by the LA Times, which we've linked to in the description, and I've posted earlier on Facebook, that basically on the Facebook post, what, did, what was the article? Over-the-counter painkillers treated painful injuries just as well as opioids in new study. Oh, snap, son! You're just a drug addict. You don't have pain. <laughs> That, it, it, and, and that's exactly what people who just read the headline thought it was saying. Okay, can I make a plea to y'all? Don't just read the effing headline. Read, okay, read the piece, and then you know what? Do me a solid. Read the actual article. Because in the actual paper, oh, wait, you will Z, see exactly what it what says. What if you have powers of inferral, such as I do? And you can't read. Mm, and you can't read. What happens then? Powers of inferral. Is that is this some kind of doctrine that was in some Federalist papers? Well, according to the powers of, in, of inferral, King George has no right stepping on my tea. You know what I'm saying? I have a good brain. It's the best brain. Everybody loves my brain. Uh, my name is Donald Trump. Uh, tell me more about it. Who uh, knew healthcare was so complicated? Tell me more because I didn't read the article. <clears throat> of course you didn't. Um, and neither I'm, more did... of a, I'm, I'm into the oral tradition of storytelling, see? <laughs> You know, I would have done a rain dance for your ass and blown some smoke signals, but uh, it would have gotten real. Anyways, let's get to the heart of the matter, guys. So when you actually look at the paper, this is what they did. And let's go through the paper briefly. Let's talk about what it actually means, because I think it has a lot of promise on one level, and it can be fairly misleading and un, un um, uh, edumacated. Edumacated, unextractable to broader issues that we talk about in terms of the opioid crisis. I mean, let's just start by saying, do you guys believe there is an opioid epidemic and crisis? And the answer is, if you don't believe there is one, F you because you're full of shit or you're dependent on narcotics or you have your head so far in your own ass that uh, you're smelling your cecum, which doesn't smell good. This country uses like 80 or 90% of the world's opioids. It does not have 80 or 90% of the world's pain. Opioid use in emergency departments has gone from 21% to something like 31% in a decade. That we're not having more pain to justify that. So something's going on. People are dying of opioid uh, overdose, starting with the prescription pills and then going on to heroin and other drugs. And, and this is documented. Anybody who works in healthcare sees it. And honestly, my feeling, Tom, and I'm gonna just, again, in, for the sake of authenticity and not giving an F, if you work in healthcare and you're denying there's a problem with opioids, you are the problem <laughs> on some level. There's something going on. There's some deep denial. And it would make me question, are you diverting drugs? Is there something else going on in your life that would explain why you would make such a ridiculous statement? Now, that being said, the pendulum is now swinging in the opposite direction where people with actual legitimate pain who need opioids, including those with chronic conditions, et cetera, are being left behind. They're being made to feel like criminals. Of course, they were being made to feel like criminals anyways because most of the time in, in the emergency department, emergency doctors are spending trying to figure out, is this guy lying to me? Am I being manipulated? And when you do that every single day, day in and day out, and patients are belligerent and they're trying to get drugs from you, the legitimate patients get missed in that signal to noise ratio. It's all noise and you're trying to sort it out. And of course, you're gonna end up interrogating people and being a dick, and that's the problem. And I think that's the pushback we get from a lot of chronic disease patients. Now, the, let me clarify a little further. When this article came out in the LA Times, you can see tons of comments on the LA Times page. And I will tell you, reading between the lines, a shit ton of those people are dependent, if not addicted, to narcotics and they are behaving as people who suffer with addiction behave when you say, you, maybe that this isn't the right drug for you, right? So that all being said, that's the context that this article comes out on. That's why it's so important as healthcare professionals to actually read the damn paper, son, and then 
analyze it critically and decide, is it going to affect our practice? And what's it going to tell us about other studies that need to be done? All right. Any comments, Tom, before we yeah, dive into this? Laura makes a great point. She mm -hmm. says, why even get to the root of the pain when we can just mask it up, Z? Oh, mm -hmm. Laura, why are you trying to get all like down to the root cause? Because that's like <laughs> whack and stuff. Like we, This is America. We put Band-Aids on shit that don't need Band-Aids, all right? By the way, Band-Aid is a trade, na uh, trade name for bandage, not otherwise specified. And uh, we don't use trade names here because we're legit. So I'm going to use a bandage. So here's the thing, guys. Here's the article. And it's in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association. The effect of a single dose of an oral opioid and non-opioid analgesics on acute extremity pain in the emergency department. Now, this is a very specific title, unlike the title of the LA Times article, which was like, hey! Hey, pain go bye-bye with OTC drugs. Okay, I know that their editor took the journalist's article because I actually read the, the piece in the LA Times. It wasn't terrible, right? It actually lays out the problem pretty good. And they said, how are we going to get people to click on this? And they put a clickbait title just like we do on this show. And then we dig into the details. So this is actually a pretty descriptive title. So what happens with a single dose of either an opioid or non-opioid analgesics, those are painkillers, when you have acute extremity pain, and in this study they defined extremity as anything distal to the shoulder or distal to the hip. So legs, um, those kind of things, uh, arms, people who are suffering musculoskeletal pain. And Logan's tweaking the camera right now, which is so awkward because um, you can't see it. But when he moves the camera, he, he reminds me of a roadie for Metallica who never quite made it. Uh, I, lo I love it. So. Um, the um, defining kind of who's in the trial is always the first step. So who's included in the trial? And this is our sort of process for looking at literature, right? Like what are the inclusion criteria? What does it take to get you in the trial? What are the exclusion tri criteria? Who wasn't allowed in the trial? Because that tells you, can you extrapolate this study to other people? And here's the thing, when I posted the article in the LA Times, there are a ton of comments like, well, I have kidney pain and my kidney pain only responds to opioids. I'm like, did you read the article? Because you would have realized that you would have been excluded from the trial because you don't have extremity pain. So you cannot make conclusions to a broad population based on a trial that excludes that population. So that's the first step, right? The, the other thing that we want to check whenever we look at a trial is who's paying for it? Are there conflicts of interest? So in this trial, they're looking at a combination of ibuprofen and Tylenol in a combo. So 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, which isn't a very high dose, and 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol. And that is kind of a high dose. Remember that, you know, Safe dose for Tylenol in a day for most adults without coexisting disease is around four grams, 4,000 milligrams. So you're taking about a fourth of that and you're taking 400 milligrams lower end dose of ibuprofen in one shot versus a pill of Vicodin. So, you know, uh, uh, actually it was basically hydrocodone, five milligrams plus Tylenol, it's like 325, like your standard Vicodin, Percocet, oxycodone, uh, Tylenol, so Vicodin, Percocet, and I forget which is which, which is hydrocodone and which is oxycodone. Tom knows because he's a drug addict. Hydrocodone is Lortab, and Percocet is oxycodone. Mm -hmm. Welcome. I don't even know if that's true. I'm not going to repeat it. It is no true, because when you take Percs, you get mad fucked up, dog. You know what I'm saying? And people who say there isn't a problem with opioids uh, need to go dig themselves a hole and lie in it. So in this case, you have Percocet, Vicodin, and this combo, and then the other thing is uh, Tylenol with codeine, which everyone knows is whack. But I've, actually, I've met addicts who, who started with Tylenol with codeine and, and swear by it as giving them a great high. Yeah, so it's, called it's called lean. It's called lean, Z. Mm -hmm. I quote Future who said, mm -hmm. I turn the Ritz into a lean house. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It's true. It means he go and drink a bunch of lean at the Ritz. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, the only reason I keep you guys around, apart from the fact that I love you, um, you're terrifyingly smart and you know how to use the equipment is that you teach me these terms that I then subsequently <laughs> flush out of my memory because they're horribly useless. Oh, by the way, my wife asked a question today. When a millennial says someone's extra, what does that mean? Extra just means like, damn, you being hella extra right now. Yeah. Like basically your whole life, like you're just hella extra. It's you know the opposite I mean? of basic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's the opposite of basic. Good to know. Because I don't know why she was asking me, and Mrs. Dog was like, what does extra mean? Because the kids are saying that I'm extra. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. That's, uh, apparently it's the opposite of basic. 
Ex if, if the kids are saying it to your wife, they just mean, Mom, you're being too much. Mm -hmm. Ah, Basically. okay. Uh, so extra, making me do my homework. We're gonna about to get extra on this study right now, because that's, <laughs> that's how basic we are. We're, gonna get, we're so basic, we're extra. That's how dope it is. Uh, and I still use dope, yes, because I was raised in the 80s and 90s. So um, you look at the, who's paying for it? So is Big Tylenol covering this? Is Big Ibuprofen covering this? Is Big Pharma covering the study, trying to prove that these opioids are superior? And when you look in this study, nope, no conflicts of interest. They're academic physicians, and they disclosed uh, none of that. And the funding is the National Institute on Aging, which had no role in, in the design and conduct of the study. So. You get that out of the way. Now, the question is, you then want to look at, well, why are we even asking the question? It turns out, and you'll be surprised, Tom, it hasn't really been looked at properly whether over-the-counter medications like Tylenol and Ibuprofen, and the reason they are combining them, it, I'll, I'll get into it in a second, it, it hasn't been looked at comparing them in a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard, double-blinded, meaning neither the study uh, performers or the study uh, subjects know what they're getting. It's totally blind, right? So it eliminates that form of bias. Um, uh, controlled trial, it's not been looked at well. They have some preliminary data that suggested that the over-the-counter drugs were kind of equivalent for certain painful conditions in the emergency department to narcotics. But for years now, we had been indoctrinated by Big Pharma, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, the um, pain industrial complex, Jayco, you know, all these guys are saying pain is a fifth vital sign that no, 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 including the WHO, the World Health Organization that has something in the 80s in 1986 called the pain ladder, which said, this is how you treat pain. Mild pain, you start out with just over the counter shit. And then you ramp it up, baby, to the Vicodin and the narcotics and the IV and the so on. And it's the ladder, because at the bottom of the ladder are these weak over-the-counter drugs. But nobody actually looked to see, could the two bottom rungs of the ladder actually be equivalent, the entry dose opioids and the over-the-counter stuff. So these guys decided to look at that question in the milieu of escalating opioid uh, disaster in the US. And they did a randomized control, double-blinded prospective trial. Great, in an emergency department setting in the Bronx, New York. And it was two emergency departments in a system of hospitals. One was an academic teaching center and one was a community center. So you should theoretically get a variety of patients. And this is what they did. So the inclusion criteria, who could be in the trial? Let's take a look. They said eligible patients were required to have a clinical indication so, so first of all, of all, they were age 21 to 64, so they were adults. And I say adult, not adult, because I'm dope. Um, You're extra. I'm extra, I'm really extra basic. Extra. That's hella extra. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they were being seen in the ED for management of acute extremity pain, which was defined as pain originating distal to, meaning further from, the, uh, and including the shoulder joint in the upper extremities and distal to and including the hip joint in the lower extremities. So there's your inclusion criteria. Eligible patients were required to have a clinical indicator for radiological imaging based on the judgment of the attending ED physician that would then provide a built-in delay because the way they were gonna do this study is they were gonna get a pain score one to 10, zero to 10, their standard pen, pain scale that we always use, and they were gonna use that as the indicator, and they were gonna get a point at point zero before you give the medication, at one hour after, and two hours after that. And the primary outcome they were gonna measure is between these groups of medications, Tylenol, Ibuprofen, Vicodin, Percocet, Tylenol with codeine, four groups, what was the change from point zero before they get the drug to two hours after in pain scores? And were those changes different across the groups? If they're very different, that means one group shows some evidence that it's more effective for pain than the other groups. Remembering that the patients and the study participants who are doing the study don't know what the patients are getting. It's totally blind. And in order to do that, then they said, okay, it has to be severe enough that you need an uh, x-ray study because that'll give us enough time to give you the drug, wait for the two hours, check it one hour and two hours and get your pain scores again. Now you were excluded if you had a path, past use of methadone, <laughs> so clearly a, not an opioid naive patient. 
if you had the presence of a chronic condition requiring frequent pain management, such as sickle cell, fibromyalgia, or any neuropathy. So already, all these people who are swarming on this study going, I have you know, chronic pain. It's like, yes, you do. This study does have nothing to do with you. It has to do with people who would enter the cycle of opioid use through a first exposure in the emergency department and then become addicted because previous studies have shown that they've compared uh, high intensity opioid ER uh, providers who prescribe a lot of those drugs to those who prescribe less. And it turns out, surprise, the ones who gave out more opioids had patients who were more likely to have opioid use disorder, dependence, addiction later. And there are some risk factors that can predict that, like if you're already a smoker, if you're an alcoholic, if you have a history of substance abuse, if you have a history of depression, anxiety, um, chronic pain, you're more likely to be a chronic, ultimately adopt chronic opioid use or misuse. So the idea is, well, if we can avoid exposing people who have a sprain or a break or something to opioids that could, in a percentage of patients, lead to addiction, abuse, and death, should we try to do that? That's the premise, the sort of hypothesis here. So when you exclude patients who have the serious chronic disease, sickle cell, things that are gonna need serious pain medication over time, you're looking at, again, those healthier patients. And those are our exclusion criteria. You're also excluding people who've taken opioids in the last 24 hours. Because if, you, if you've already taken like Vicodin, Percocet, Dilated, whatever, then it's gonna confound the study results. Or if you've taken ibuprofen and Tylenol within the past eight hours. So same thing. Uh, if you were pregnant, you were excluded. Um, if you're breastfeeding, you're excluded. If you have a history of peptic ulcer disease or used recreational narcotics, you're excluded. Peptic ulcer disease because ibuprofen can provoke peptic ulcer disease and bleeding because of the way it works. Ibuprofen inhibits COX-1 and COX-2, mm -hmm. which are... <laughs> <laughs> Did you just laugh at COX? No. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I keep them around. And uh, uh, it inhibits those uh, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 inhibitors that make prostaglandins. The COX-1 proxy, the cyclooxygenase 1 prostaglandins also, in addition to provoking pain, also protect the stomach lining and also, <laughs> god damn you too, also, uh, also uh, lead to help platelets to function well. So. Ibuprofen can, it can cause bleeding and it can also cause uh, ulceration of the stomach by inhibiting those particular prostaglandins. If you guys remember the COX-2 specific inhibitors that were all the rage for a while and are still occasionally used are more selective and cause less ulcer ulcerative uh, disease. So that being said, those were the, the sort of exclusion criteria or if you had other medical conditions, like hypothyroidism, things that would interfere with the drugs or listen to this carefully, if you are on an SSRI or a tricyclic antidepressant or these drugs that might interfere with and interact with the painkillers. So those guys were excluded. So remember now that this doesn't apply to people who are on antidepressants. Maybe they have a different response to these drugs. So already you're getting a sense of where and where, where, and where you can't apply the results of this trial. All right, so Tom, any comments or anything you wanna read before I dig in more? No, nope. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Town always inhibits my coxy. Oh my God. <laughs> By the way, speaking of inhibiting your cox, here's the thing, Logan. Do you, does, do you, either of you guys know how Tylenol works? No, but I take you a know, lot of I it. heard that nobody knows how Tylenol works. You heard correctly. Really? Yeah. So Tom got it right. <clears throat> nobody has a fucking clue how Tylenol works. <laughs> right. They yeah. really don't. They have theories, and, but if you actually dig into it, nobody knows exactly how Tylenol works works. They've even proposed a COX-3, oh, which is way man. bigger than a 2 or a 1 COX, <laughs> it, it, that, that's more functional in the brain, and they think it might be a central thing, and there's some evidence that actually Tylenol numbs emotional pain as well. So nobody knows. Wait, Tylenol, Tylenol numbs emotional pain? Hey, so man. I take so much? I'm going to pop those Tylenols. That's By the way, dope. If I'm going to take hella Tylenol now. <laughs> if you all think Tylenol and ibuprofen are perfectly safe, you're crazy. They have narrow therapeutic windows and can kill you, both of them. So just understand that these are not with, without complications. Some people don't tolerate them, so, so on and so forth. But this was the milieu in which this study was done. So here's the thing. They did the, did the prospective. They divided it randomly into these four groups, each of them about 100 patients. Most of the patients, it was an intention to treat analysis, which means if you get enrolled in the trial, 
we're going to treat you as if we're going to treat you, even if you drop out, even if something happens, even if you're later found to not be uh, qualified, we're still going to proceed as if you were going to get treated because that's how it works in the real world. So that's how it worked. And um, the way it worked is if they would give them the drug that they were randomized to. If they still had horrible pain, they could get a rescue drug. Now this is where it got interesting. The rescue drug was, a, um, I think, a five milligram oxycodone unblinded. So they would go, here's your oxycodone, because you're failing this. And this is where it got interesting in the results. So this may be a potential confounder across the groups. So that being said, they then all got, I, and by the way, the pills all looked the same. They had a pharmacist mix them up so that they were just capsules, three capsules, no matter what. They just mixed the drugs into these three capsules. So it wasn't clear what you were getting. So the hard, if they were secret hardcore opioid addicts, they would have no idea what they were really getting. And this is what they measured, that 11 point freaking pain scale that we all hate, where zero is a smiley face and 10 is a person crying bloody tears, the worst possible pain you've ever had. Guess what the average pain level was of these people who had fractures and sprains and things like that? Eight point something. So this is like literally you're giving birth pain. Mm -hmm. um, By and the way, can I just say that the smiley face makes zero aspirational? Why can't yeah, zero why be, be like a flat affect just like, you know, honestly, I would love like six to be aspirational. Like six is a guy like Buddy Jesus, just like this. And uh, unfortunately, no, they make zero the, uh, the thing you're supposed to aspire to, which is bullshit. Because, because you're like, well, I'm not in pain, but I'm not as happy as that guy. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm numbed as fuck right now, but that kid's smiling and I can't even, I can't even move my face right now because I'm so freaking high. No, it's true. And, and the thing is, again, the, the, we can talk about the pain scale another time. We measure it as a vital sign. It's an, uh, a subjective question you ask people. So one man's eight is another man's two or one woman's two. So that being said, this is what they measured. The primary outcome was the difference in mean change in this pain score between the zero hour and the two hours later uh, among the different groups, okay? And they, they, in advance, they said, listen, if your pain score doesn't change by at least 1.3, and this has been previously validated using this pain scale, it doesn't make, it's not clinically significant. So a difference between a seven and an 8.3 is just barely not even significant. So they set that as kind of a bar and then they said, okay, do we reach any statistically significant difference between these groups? And this is what they, um, let's see what else they did here. They, um, they also looked at how many people got the rescue drug, the rescue uh, oxycodone. And um, also they looked at the people with the pain scores of 10 and sub-analyze them like, okay, now these guys are really hurting. Are there differences in people with severe pain? This is what they found. By the way, you always wanna look at are there differences between the groups. There were no statistically significant differences in race, ethnicity, pre-existing conditions, et cetera, between the four groups. And most of them were minorities. This was in Brooklyn, and sorry, in the Bronx. I may have misspoken before and said Brooklyn. It's in the Bronx. Dude, instead of a numbered pain scale, maybe we should have like a metaphorical pain scale, you know? Like angst? Like zero is like hanging out in a bean bag. And then like a two is like dinner with your in-laws, you know? And then like an eight <laughs> is like being set on fire. And then like a 10. I think a 10 is like having to be at dinner with your in-laws. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it like comes back, full it circle, reverts, reverts, but it's like yeah. it's been two hours now <laughs> and you're at a 10. You're at dinner with your in-laws, but dinner won't be ready for another like hour and a half. Whoa. You have to sit there and make chit chat. Oh, and someone yeah. told Uncle Mike to tell the story about that one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's a 10 plus. It's an 11. Uh, that would be much more relatable. Actually, I think you're right. Yeah. Now that he's smiley. I think we should rewrite the pain scale. We're just the guys that do it. You know what? I think we may have found a cause celebre. Zero is when you hear the word cox and you giggle like a school child. <laughs> As I, I must be at a zero because that made me giggle. 48% um, were female, so roughly 50-50 male, female. 60% were Latino. 31% were black. Now, why does this matter? Well, knowing the ethnic profile of the subjects is just good to know, but there has been previous data that African Americans are undertreated with narcotics and maybe due to some unconscious racial bias that they're, you know, something's going on. And so they get less narcotics and so they're actually less prone to getting opioid abuse. So this is one of those things where racial bias actually may help the African-American community 
uh, if not control their pain, because there's a bias that somehow African Americans have a higher pain tolerance, which we've talked about before, and that's horseshit. So that being said, uh, this is what they found. And I'm not going to show you this horrible chart because it gives me a headache to look at, so I'm just going to tell you. So first of all, you got to understand, in the four groups, the mean sort of uh, drop in pain score between zero hour and four hours later, no matter what the group was, was somewhere in the four range. So it turns out, and they were all little variations, none of them statistically significant. All four groups got good pain relief, going from an average of eight point something to four point something, regardless of what they got. And that tells you something right there. It tells you, well, okay, now we really need to dig in. If this is true, the cheap, relatively safe, over-the-counter medications as a first-line agent for acute pain in the extremities in the emergency department setting may be just as good as opioids. Why not start with that as opposed to giving people a bunch of opioids and running a risk that they're going to be that one person that doesn't get off them? And so that's what it's purporting. Now, here are the complications of this. 73 patients, or 18% across all the groups, got rescue analgesics. So, you know, one in five patients got that extra five of oxycodone. Now, could that be, t across the groups, it was similar. There was no real subgroup difference. They all got that. So it's not like the OTC group got more of that. They all got an equivalent amount of rescue analgesics if they needed it. The question is, is that driving all the numbers then to show no difference across the groups when 20% of them are all getting this 5 of oxycodone that kind of levels it out? The authors at the end of the article talk about this, and they say they did an analysis where they went back and they used something called imputed pain score, and they found that actually there would have been, even with this oxycodone, there would have been no difference in the analysis. There was still no difference across groups. This oxycodone rescue dose in the 18% of patients wasn't covering up some difference that would have been there. Now, I'm not a smart enough statistician to understand what imputed pain score means, but it sounds a little squirrely to me. So that would be one piece that I would want to get the authors on the show and mm. say, explain to me exactly why this wouldn't cover up the mistake. And I would assume in the peer review process they would have addressed that, but that's one of the biggest, in my mind, potential bugaboos in this trial, and if it's overcome, that's great. The findings are valid. If it's not, we need to talk about that, okay? So that being said, wow, those findings are kind of crazy because it says, well, could it be that this combo, and now remember that one of the poor purported mechanisms of giving Tylenol and ibuprofen, and this isn't often done in the U.S. It's done in New Zealand and in Australia. You can buy like combos, but in the U.S. we don't really do that. They have different mechanisms of action. So the ibuprofen is the COX inhibitors, and the Tylenol is this mystery potion that may be a bit of COX, it may be a bit of this, a little bit of fairy dust and unicorn juice. Either way, they're different enough that putting them together in the right doses might be more useful than giving one or the other. So that being said, um, it turns out when they looked at the subgroup analysis of people who were rating their pain as a 10 or who had a documented fracture, so legit pain, um, the results were similar. No difference across the groups. So it doesn't matter whether you had a real fracture, whether you were a 10 out of 10, or whether you just had a sprain, you were, you, there were no differences between the, the different groups. And one of the things you should know when they looked at the final diagnosis, most of them were strain, uh, strain or sprain, and then there were uh, uh, a good percentage of fractures, and then some were muscle pain, contusion, or other. Okay, so it's a lot of, you know, most people got bandages, splints, a few people got casts, some people got ice. So just to know who these people were. By the way, this, I've broken this arm twice, mm. and I've only ever gotten Tylenol. Nobody's ever given me anything beyond Tylenol. And you're a, you're a derelict <clears throat> uh, recreational drug abuser. Yeah, but see, I don't seek drugs because I'm a man about my pain scale. They're like, it's manly to be like, yo, my arm's broken. What's your pain? It's like a two. <laughs> Maybe a 1.6. And it gets to the heart of what is pain. It's an experience in the mind. And Tom tweaks his mind to say, this is not a thing. And other people who are more anxious, who are maybe scared, who have other trauma, maybe the pain threshold is different. Maybe you're genetically, your pain threshold is different. So pain is a very subjective thing. Nicole says, a favorite patient ever in her room during yoga, says her pain is a 14 out of 10. I, stu <laughs> I, stu I stupidly ask, how is she doing yoga? She looks at me and snarls, it's a modified pose. 
<laughs> Freaking downward dork, man. That's uh, that's ridiculous. No, but you know, we get this all the time and then people wonder why we're so cynical and chronic pain patients are like, why are you treating us like criminals? Because we're constantly manipulated and made to feel like people think we're complete idiots and are pulling the wool over our eyes. We're like, no, we're really kind of kind of sharp. Um, the, so basically, um, the idea is, can we then generalize further from this study? Not yet. So what this says is, hey, okay, if you're an emergency department physician, it may make sense to change your practice to start with Tylenol ibuprofen and then escalate if needed, right? As opposed to, but he here's the thing. Now here are the, some of the weaknesses that we really have to think about. First of all, they only followed up for two hours. So they didn't see, okay, did the shit wear off in a different way among the four groups? So when the patient went home, did they go batshit, right? What did they get when they went home? Did they end up getting narcotics anyways? You know, so these are things like the follow-up. What's the long-term stuff? Also, if you're gonna be, how long are you gonna take the ibuprofen and the Tylenol? Is it gonna become a problem with toxicity? Are you gonna get side effects? They didn't look at adverse effects in this trial. Now, previous smaller studies had shown that the adverse effects were similar in the groups except for the oxycodone group, which had very high adverse effects, mostly lightheadedness. And they used a double dose of oxycodone in those groups. Now, the second thing is look at the doses in this trial. Five of oxycodone, five of hydrocodone. These are like a pill and a pill of Vicodin, of regular strength Vicodin and, and, and Percocet. Not a very high dose for someone who just fractured an arm. And so it's no surprise there were rescue doses needed. So the question is, should they do a version where they give a slightly higher dose? The reason they chose this dose is that some of these patients are opioid naive. They've never had opioids before and they wanted to see, can we do it at a lower dose and still get adequate pain relief? And what they found is well, probably, you know, but there was breakthrough. So dosing was interesting. The other thing is um, the, uh, again, the rescue analgesic, did that kind of mess up the, uh, the study and they don't think it did. So that, those are things you wanna think about before you would extrapolate this trial to the rest of the world. So guys, this, the fact that these guys are doing this study and it hasn't been done is ridiculous. Like here we are operating in the world as physicians based on intuition, experience and other people, what they're doing and what our societies tell us to do. In the opioid setting, it took a letter to the New England Journal in 1980 saying, opioids are totally non-addictive when you have real pain, bro, based on like one limited case study in one hospital that changed practice. Then you have the WHO's pain ladder, you have JACO saying pain is a vital sign, and the next thing you know, and you have the, the, the Purdue Pharmaceutical uh, teaching doctors that, hey, this new Oxycontin thing is the bomb, is you're gonna control pain, you're gonna be more compassionate, and now we have this disaster. How about just fucking studying it? And not just studying it, but reading the primary literature as an intelligent healthcare professional, learning to analyze the literature, having a conversation, a little mini journal, journal club, and hashing it out, and then doing the follow-up studies. Can we do that, people? Because that's what we ought to be doing if we're practicing personalized, evidence-based medicine that isn't a one-size-fits-all, but that understands the nuance of it, but has a basis in science and evidence. What do you think, Tom Heinemann? You see what y'all done did? You made Z mad when you didn't do your science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm extra. <laughs> extra dope. What do you uh, say? I say that this, feed. this was, I say Cut we killed, it. I think we had a decent discussion. I wanna hear your comments. We're gonna look through them. Um, share this, please. Educate people. Uh, I'm gonna get about 40, okay, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna get 40, thousand emails all of them about this many paragraphs about how i have chronic pain <laughs> you don't know and my pain my pain's different than all the other pains you're part of the problem z dog you don't know my pain you don't want to give me my narcotics and you i'm gonna say I think, uh, we need to give all these uh whiners <laughs> a little bit of nietzsche nietzsche that's my drug of choice yeah a little existentialism yeah because yeah. what doesn't kill you z makes you stronger. <laughs> now you just triggered another 400 emails to me, Tom. You tell Tom he's never suffered with chronic regional pain syndrome. And I'll be like, he hasn't. He broke his finger like a bitch playing a drinking game on his 
computer and I don't even know how he did it. By the way, to the people that are sending uh, Z rambling emails about the blockchain, keep doing that. It's hilarious. <laughs> Every time I get an email, someone's like, I have a solution for medical issues with the new blockchain-based solution, the fork in the road and the blockchain and zeros and ones. I'm like, Tom Heineber, forward. <laughs> this is what you've done with your Bitcoin nonsense. I'm like, tell me about your plan, Mr. Cryptocurrency person. And they're like, here's the thing, I don't have one. And I'm like, you're gonna fit in perfectly here. <laughs> <laughs> and we out. Love you, Z Pack. I'm extra. That's the birthday. That's the birthday.